This week's show brought to you by Tom Brady. Fuck that guy. All right, Brian, I don't uh, like to cuss on the show a lot, but I I wasted it in the tease because, you know, got to give it to the Patriots, but whatever. Uh, Anyway, welcome to the Box Score Geek Show. I'm your host, Dre Alvarez. And uh, with me, as always, is my producer, voice of God, man of many hat, Brian Foster. Say hey, Brian. What's going on, Dre? And yeah, we are the day after the NFC and AFC Championship game 2019. And Twitter is really mad about Tom Brady. You are not wrong about that. Do, do we want to? Uh, so to give the big to give the big spoiler of what we're going to talk on the show, the kind of two major topics. The first one, I'm sorry, I guess I, I think I tweeted this last week. I guess we're a Rockets podcast now. I'm sorry, yeah. they keep winning the news cycle. Like basic, you know, if, if we're if we're a 24 hour news show once a week, whatever. The Houston Rockets just keep having the most interesting show like they keep doing a donald trump like something else more interesting comes in the news and houston goes no the difference is they're in the news for something good this week dre which donald trump never is yeah i'm trying to think but it is also martin luther king day today and when i was a kid i loved martin luther king and all holidays because they got me out of school i was always grateful to him for that not being a very aware child of course and now as an adult Maybe I appreciate him a little more in that we get all these NBA games just like on Christmas and all the other holidays. So great sure NBA day today. The hard work he did, he'd be like, thank you. Yes. Clear going for that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, how about we, we start with the NFL and then we'll, we'll get to those show topics and then we'll kind of get into our normal rhythm. Because I figure, you know, we don't really talk football that much. I think you and I might be in the same boat where it's a lot easier for me to dislike football and I'm not really – a football fan per se, but I live close enough in proximity. I'm in Wisconsin. So that's huge Packers, huge Badgers. Badgers is college for those that don't know. And then of course I'm from Colorado where, you know, the Broncos are, you know, a church essentially. It was kind of interesting that when I would go to church on occasion back in the day, it would be very common to see people in in Broncos church on Sunday. So, you know, I'm kind of in the proximity of it. So you kind of, I think Patrick has discussed this before in the past, as much as we can rail against it on the show, you kind of find yourself sucked into it if you're in the right market. And I think I am, and I think you you have been in the past. So uh, let, let's talk some football, uh, I figure, first, and we can, can move on from there. And then the big news, right, is Tom Brady made it back to the Super Bowl. I think, as Dave Barry has noted many, many times about this, it's important to note that football is not like basketball because Tom Brady only plays half the game. He plays offense. And that a lot of the Patriots' success has not only been not thanks to Tom Brady, either even on the offense. I think, am am I going to get the kicker right? Tell me if I screw up the pronunciation. I believe it's Adam Vinatieri. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't think he's on the Patriots anymore, though. Is he? I thought he went to the Colts or something. But I was going to say, I am... Oh, you're thinking back to the day. I'm 90-some-odd certain that on... Uh, Tom Brady's very first Super Bowl win. Yes, it's against the Rams. So inter- interesting. This is this is this is actually a very nice bookmark if like Brady retires after this because Brady's first Super Bowl win was against the St. Louis Rams uh, in Super Bowl XXX VI. Was that 1999? Uh, did you get it right? 2001. 2001. Okay. Although it's still absurd that it, it was that long ago. Uh, but it was a game-winning kick by Adam Vinatieri. I hope I'm getting the name right. So Yeah, hey, Brady is older than me, so I love it when players stick around. I still have some players in the league that are older than me. That's great. Yeah, but so that point, that, that win was a 2017 win where the game winner was um, a kicker making a field goal and they hadn't scored a touchdown in two quarters. So that there, there's that. Uh, many times uh, the opposing coach made stupid calls that resulted in um, the New England Patriots winning. So I will actually say, like, my take, this pains me, is that last year's Super Bowl, despite the fact that they lost, Tom Brady should have been MVP. I I, I really thought he was the finals MVP. And I think he had an interception or fumble. I forget what it was counted up. But I I watched the play, and it was the most ridiculous thing ever, where essentially his linemen – was out of position, and a guy broke through and basically hit the lineman into Brady. So the lineman got out of position, then got hit into Brady, and then hit Brady into someone else, and then Brady, like, arm got hit and caused the ball to get knocked loose, and it got counted as interception. So 
as much as you know, you you heard what I said to start the show. As much as I hate Brady, um, for reasons both on and off the off the field, uh, what he did last year as like a forty year old was freaking ridiculous. And so he he is an impressive athlete, but I think it's funny he he epitomizes the yay rings thesis where if you really deconstruct his titles. So many of them were out of his control directly. Right? It's not even like the NBA where we can argue Michael Jordan wasn't important to a, t- a title run as Dennis Rodman or wasn't as important to a title run as Scottie Pippen. Both of those players did have better playoffs than Michael Jordan at one point, despite the fact that we would agree that Michael Jordan for that six finals run of the Bulls in the 90s does deserve a lion's share. We've got absolutely no complaint with that thing. We just say he wasn't the biggest one. In Tom Brady's case, there were cases where it's you're not on the field, it's not your call, and the Patriots won because of something someone else did. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look, but I can get on board with that idea. But one thing I'll say is I think that's just a byproduct of NFL playoffs being best of one and being single, being very short. You know, and the reason I bring that up is I I think there is a argument for him being the best NFL player of all time if not it's like you know Peyton Manning basically so those two just have put up so much reg- better regular season numbers than anyone else and part of it's the era they're in you know they're the first two guys that just kind of said yeah we're just going to throw it a ton and basically be our own offensive coordinator and run it all ourselves right so so yeah, I mean he's an innovator, and you know you can dislike him personally or his politics like we do, but he's you know I, I still think Tom Brady deserves the accolades as unlikable as he may be. <laughs> so what what gets amusing is Kobe Bryant comes up routinely. So I like how we keep tying it back to uh, basketball to at least keep it relevant. Kobe Bryant, one thing that we say about him is, for as much as we want to say his peak does not deserve the same accolades as players like Michael Jordan or LeBron James. His longevity is ridiculous. Now, one of the nice things that I love about LeBron James, for instance, at this point is LeBron James has now bypassed Kobe's longevity. Even if even if LeBron James is done, heaven forbid, he still managed to have one more season than Kobe where he made a push to the finals essentially on his own. So that, that you know, takes it out. But Kobe Bryant, if you factor in longevity and greatness is probably fuck this is gonna hurt brian (laughs) i'm gonna disagree aren't i top 15 probably and we're gonna get into this subject a little later on the show it's one of my curmudgeonly things i have great respect for the nba pre-magic and larry bird I, I really do. The, 1980 is the first year with the three-point line. It was when Larry Bird and Magic Johnson entered the league. It, it really ushered in the modern NBA. We, we finally had the complete box score that we at least have now so we can compare. I don't have as much respect for the NBA before that era for a multitude of reasons. I mean, it was only eight teams back when it started. So the people that say Bill Russell has the most rings, it's – it's like it was an eight-team league with no free agency. That I bet we could find fifteen post nineteen eighty. Fifteen or fourteen if you pick Wilt. I think Wilt is better than Kobe, no matter I'm what. I'm saying longevity plus regular season performance plus postseason performance. I think if if, if you mm. kind of you're kind of decathlon, where you know, for for instance, that this gets into a, a hard territory. Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, as amazing as they were, you know, both of them lasted, um, I think, 11 NBA seasons. That sounds right. Yeah. And both of them missed a complete NBA, almost a complete NBA season due to injury, at least. And I think Larry Bird missed like one and a half towards the end. That's only 10 years of NBA play. So if I there's a couple of striker lockout seasons, too, right? um, Partial seasons. Not for them. They, they they lucked out into not having partials. Okay, they were uh, out before that happened. It was uh, 99 and 2012, I think, are the two. Yeah, they were both gone by then. And then what I was going to say, so if we did some kind of threshold of saying a player that's played at least twice as long as the average NBA career, which would be like 12 years, we think they both trounce Kobe Bryant, or we could give them, you know, a um, you know kind of waiver and say, if you've played X good, you get to waive it, and so I'm fine with that. But I'm just saying... 
once you start putting things like that, like longevity, and then we even agree with this point that postseason play is kind of harsh. It's it's not a really fair metric to judge someone on. But there are some players, you know, Tracy McGrady is an example, who just did not get a chance to show how good they were in the postseason. So it's kind of one of those, they're off the lift by, off, that's a hard sentence to say because it's got a lot of Fs in it. Off the list by omission. There we go. Those players, and it's not any fault of theirs, but so it's kind of like I'm, I'm saying if, if you put all of those on. But what I'd say to your Tom Brady point is I think longevity, he just – longevity, postseason success, no one can touch him. And in his peak and his peak seasons, and I think Brian Burke agrees, right? Brian Burke of uh, pro NFL stats who's, you know, just the – or advanced NFL stats, just, you know, the person we respect the most on this. I think he'd agree at Tom Brady's peak. He, he's one of the best in the league. So I, I think – I think he's just Kareem, Dre. He just played forever and was great per year. I I think Tom Brady as Kareem is is an absolutely perfect example. Played forever. You know, Kareem got a finals MVP in what, 87, I think, the last one, which is which I think there was a I think there was a 14 or 15 year gap, and Tom Brady might be the same. I think I think you're gonna pay me, and this this may very well be this this show's title, Brian, which even though it's gonna have nothing to do with everything else we talk about. Tom Brady is Kareem, um, I think, is completely apt. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk the controversy. Uh, and and by Ooh. the way, you, you may notice me being rude and looking at my phone. Uh, <laughs> Google decided to log me out. Um, decided to log me out right as we started the show, and I'm waiting for the two-factor authentication. So that's that's why I'm that's why I'm like sitting here staring at my phone. So anyway, um, the other part though. Uh, we are actually – I'm kind of happy that the the St. – not St. Louis, the Los Angeles Rams won and are advancing. Uh, for those of you that don't know, rest in peace, Brett Barrett worked um, for the Cronky organization and among the teams under that umbrella are the St. Louis, now Los Angeles Rams. So he was a huge Rams fan. And it's amazing that they're going to the playoffs. And, you know, I, it, it's uh, – you've heard us talk a few times on the show about Brett Barrett before where we're just really bummed we lost him this last year. Uh, but they're going to the Super Bowl, so that's that's you know I'm with all of the other teams I would be rooting for in the playoffs out. I kind of do a very, I'm sure this pisses off people, but you know when 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 the playoffs start, if teams I like aren't in it, I just pick other teams. So for instance, I may disqualify myself as a Packers fan, but I was like briefly rooting for the Bears just because a couple people I like like them, and then when they lost, I was like, yeah, screw you guys, because um, I am a Packers fan, <laughs> but. Uh, I, I'm excited that the Rams made the uh, the finals uh, in part because of Brett Barrett. But then the sad part is, and I know you've seen this clip, Brian, uh, and I don't know any of the names, so I apologize. I don't know the names of the players this happened to. I didn't watch the game. I'm going to – that's not quite true. I watched about a quarter and a half of the game because we were at a bowling alley and it was on. So I did watch some of the game. But uh, – there was a hit at the end that was very contentious, and it was, uh, you know, you know the rules of football better than me, Brian, mm-hmm. but right, if, if you're throwing a pass to someone, you're not really allowed to mess with the passer before they are, like, touching the ball or some something. And the, the, the receiver or the quarterback? The receiver, right? The receiver, yeah. So after the quarterback throws the ball, yeah, when the ball's in the air, you can't grab that receiver. And and have you seen this clip, right, where essentially the receiver just gets laid out? You know, I did watch that game, but I don't think I watched the whole thing because I missed that clip. <laughs> I don't want us to get – I don't want us to get a strike, and unfortunately the NFL, is, the NFL and WWE are two organizations that I don't want to touch. Of, of the few shows that we've actually gotten dinged on, uh, WWE did knock us off at one. So I don't want to risk that. But if you look this up, Brian, if you look up the clip of the, uh, of the New Orleans Saints player – I, it would have to be called pass interference. It just gets laid out before the ball's anywhere near him. And then the rough part is if you look at the angle, the referee is staring right at him. And there's no flag. There's no whistle. And then, of course, the Rams go on to win. So so it's kind of egregious, and I'm hearing mm. some complaint about that. And it's 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 hard to disagree with because I think a uh, few tweets I saw someone was like, you know, we have this this the advantage of television, right? When you watch a game on television, you have the best angle and crystal clear HD, and you know the referees on the field and they don't have the great view. If you look at the angle of the referee who's standing, I think three to four feet away from this play, uh, it's egregious that that call wasn't made. Yeah, and you know, I saw an NBA play yesterday that was kind of similar to that, where the basically <laughs> the announcers were complaining. They're like, 
Uh, it was it was Jeff Van Gundy, actually. Here's who it is. And he has a funny way of talking about rule changes, right? We talk about this all the time on the show. I feel like he proposes at least one rule change per show. He said something like, this is what I hate about replay. Why can't they use it on foul calls? Neither the NBA or the NFL, for most penalties or fouls, lets the refs go back and change it. It has to be a judgment call right there. So, yeah, that's kind of weird. Why can't they expand instant replay for okay. stuff so like I'm, that? I'm glad you let me into this this subject. So mm-hmm. there are a few there are a few takes I have. So one I one thing I have about sports is if we if we think about any given of the major sports in the United States, let's say basketball, hockey, football, baseball, and you're trying to say let's make a rule to make this game more logical. All of these games are ridiculous. Hockey, as an example, is people skating and hitting galvanized uh, pieces of rubber with sticks into fishermen's nets. That's the game. And, you know, basketball is throwing a volleyball, and volleyball on its own was already a ridiculous game, but it's throwing, I believe, a volleyball into a peach basket. I mean, all of these games are ridiculous. So when you're like, let's make rules to fix them, the metaphor I thought in my head is it reminds me so much of when people watch superhero movies and then try and explain how they would make the plot more logical. And especially when you delve into stupid sexist and racist tropes where you're like, a, a Norse god in Thor, the uh, Marvel movie, can't be black. And you're like, <laughs> so you're cool with the embodiment of a Norse god being a superhero, but the race is, and then the same thing with like, Women, where they go, well, women back in the day wouldn't do this. You're like, oh, so your your fantasy story, including dragons, uh, you want it to be historically accurate. The story with dragons. So, so you know, all you're that- you're talking about in Thor, the character Heimdall is played by Idris Elba, right? Is that that's what you're talking about? Yeah. I, I, what, I, is, I, what I want to know is why does he have an American accent when he's a black British guy from Asgard? Why do they have to? Ch- does, he does, right? In Thor, doesn't he have an American accent? I don't know. He did in The Wire as well, so I guess it's fine. You're being on the same boat. <laughs> it's like, like, why is this? It's like it doesn't have – it's okay. So it's it's kind of the same point. For sports, when I see people say, let's change the rule to make the game more blah, I find that there are two kind of parts about that. One is the games are inherently silly. And so let's not act as if we're going to make them less silly with rule changes. The second case is when you're arguing people would want it. One thing about replay, I actually was lucky enough back in the day to go to a Warriors game. And there was this play where the ball glanced, went out of bounds, and there was an argument whether it glanced off a player's head. And they stopped the game and were watching the replay. And it was it was a hard it was a hard play to call. It was because you know the ball's angle didn't change very much, and I don't even remember what they called. But stopping the game to watch a replay is not the most fun, and it gets it gets tiring. So. In a lot of these sports, they're saying, oh, we've got to add this rule because if we don't, the fans will blah. And I find a lot of times, this was Wages of Wins Chapter 1, the things that fans complain about does not always correlate with the things the fans will pay to see. Fans will say we want a more fair playoffs, but I guarantee you if you did a 30-round, round-robin competition with two days rest between every game for all of the for all of the teams so they could be as close to full health to decide the NFL champion, I guarantee a lot of people would just be like, screw this, I'm done. Or just wake me for the finals, right? I don't give a damn. So I do find with a lot of rule changes um, – when, when people propose them, it's not going to fix anything. Now, that being said, the one area I have found myself saying I'd be okay with rule changes is when it is player health and player safety. And this this category might count because, you know, it is roughing the passer or whatever, pass interference, whatever you want to call it. That player looked like they got hurt. So that one I might be okay with. But up the people saying if we don't change the rules, no one will take the football final seriously. What you just said, the one and done point. Football has been a ludicrous set of finals for years, and no one's complained. And I, I don't think changing the rules is going to make more or less people watch. Yeah, and I agree. And you know, when both of those games went to overtime, I want to say yesterday, or at least they were they went down to the wire if they didn't. So they were basically toss ups anyway, right? They were even games that were just decided by the end by one little thing. So. Yeah, I mean, the fans hate it that it gets decided that way, but but someone has to win. But, I mean, if you go back to where football came from anyway, right, there's always there's always been kind of this veneer of seriousness around it. Um, where it, it so it was developed basically in the Ivy League schools, right? We've talked about this on the show before. It was developed in the Ivy League schools, Harvard and Yale, in the, you know, 
kind of late 19th century between the Civil War and World War I, which was a long time of relative peace in the United States. And the Ivy League, you know, students, I guess, were just like, oh, we're getting soft. There's no wars. So we have to invent this game called football that simulates trench warfare, basically. That was why they made the game. And it was much more dangerous back then. Like Teddy Roosevelt basically cleaned it up. There was multiple deaths every year in college football back then. So, you know, it's, you know, it is basically based on war and it's gone, you know, for decades and decades like that. So, I mean, you know, that they, they'll probably clean it up. They'll probably find a way to get around concussions, but who knows? I mean, football has a lot of bigger issues. <laughs> Okay, so tangent on tangent on tangent, Brian. Uh, a few things. So the actual rule changes. So that that was one area. The other area, because you were talking replay, the main one I saw was like the OT rules, which have been silly forever. And you know, back in the day, it used to basically be if you won the coin toss, you were like guaranteed to win because you only had to get a field goal, right? So or some high percentage, right? And I'm seeing people say we need to change the OT rules. That's what they've been complaining about. Yeah, when. that's fair. And because you were saying, I think one or both the games did go to OT. I love how much we've devoted to this segment, even though neither of us really watched. But yeah, I'm saying it's it's not going to fix anything. I'm going to get another uh, tangent I didn't put on the script, Brian, but I, I'm glad you you with your comment about warfare and getting soft. I had the damnedest uh, experience listening to a podcast. So I, I, I do listen to wrestling podcasts on occasion, even though I don't really watch the WWE anymore. Uh, since Roman Reigns uh, beat Triple H for the title a few years back, I was just like, nope, I'm out and uh, haven't been drawn back in. And so Dean Ambrose is champion right now. Is, damn it. <laughs> well, one of the titles, yeah. Oh, would, you got to see, Dre. He's back to being the lunatic fringe again. Is, is it real? Oh, I mean, he came back looking like Triple H when he shaved the hair and all that. So, And it was buff because he got injured. So, I mean, that that was... Damn it, Brian, though, this has happened before. Like, I've gotten interested, and then I start listening. I'm like, nope. But anyway, uh, Jim Ross and Jim Cornette, um, two of the big, biggest you know, commentators and names in wrestling, there was a podcast they were having, and they were talking about the state of the WWE. And Jim Ross was relaying to Jim Cornette that the women's division is the hot thing right now, and the men's division seems to be floundering. And what they were noting is the women are taking chances and trying new things and kind of the same thing that everybody praises about the attitude era and that the men's division for, for a variety of reasons, nobody's willing to try and take chances and, and do risks to get over. And so that's why the women's division, everybody likes it right now in the men's division. They don't. And as I mentioned, hmm. I haven't been watching, so who knows, but then he unironically said, well, in the men's division, one of them just needs to get the balls to try something new if they want to catch up with the women's division. And I thought that was the most hilarious colloquialism to use there because they just spent on their show like about five to ten minutes discussing the women are doing better because they're, they're, they're being more courageous and trying new things and then use the phrase, get the balls for the men's division, which I thought was just hilarious. So That is uh, funny. Both of those guys are kind of left wing too, I think. So that makes it even funnier. They all, I mean, it, well, it's and that that's always been an interesting schism in in wrestling, and was actually one of the things back in the day that kind of hurt it is that wrestling is always seen as more of a southern thing, more of a the the fan base has been seen as more um, Republican, even though what's odd is a lot of the fans online are more left leaning, and then actually. A lot of the like the the Turner Broadcasting Network when they were bought out by Time Warner, a lot of the executives basically didn't like wrestling because they kind of viewed it as more lowbrow. So the, the the left versus right leaning thing is very interesting because yeah, a lot of the wrestlers, a lot of the talent is very left leaning, and then some of the storylines and then some of the fan base is right. So it is a funny thing. Well, and also let's state the obvious: wrestling, pro wrestling, the U.S. is WWE right, controlled by the McMahon's family. They are in tight with Trump. Linda McMahon is even in Trump's cabinet. Yeah. So that's an obvious <laughs> political affiliation as well. By the way, uh, 21st tangent on the show already, Brian. If you're taking a shot every time Dre has a tangent, you're going to be drunk way quick tonight. Uh, what I was going to say is I've had this thought in my head before, Brian. I'll see if you agree. I really view SNL and the WWE very, very similarly, especially hmm. – in the fact that so Lorne Michaels runs SNL and uh, Vince McMahon runs the WWE, and they're both kind of getting older, have both been out of touch for a long while. And yeah. I mean, that's that's just what happens when you get rich and both actually do kind of lean a little right or, you know, almost so many billionaires basically go, 
I'll still be Republican because they'll give me tax cuts. I'll let the, I'll let the USA burn if it means I don't have to pay two percent more in tax. Uh, but but what's interesting is on SNL it it likes to tout itself as a liberal show and people like to do it. But really, SNL loves the characters of people like Donald Trump because it's ratings. And the same thing has been true of the WWE. They've actually had Donald Trump on the show. So it's like I view both SNL and WWE as a rich white right winger running a show that likes using caricatures of um, Republicans in many cases to make money. And, you know, it's kind of just funny. One fan base is like SNL is so clever and wrestling's low brown, whatever. And I honestly think they're the same thing. So, that, that's yeah. So here. OK, here's something that's funny in wrestling I've been thinking about. So the new Daniel Bryan, right? Have you heard about this, Dre? I have not. I just OK. Told OK, okay. so I'll tell you what's going So the new Daniel Bryan, basically a few weeks ago, maybe it's been a couple months ago now, Daniel Bryan turned heel. He's been faced the whole time since he came back from injury. And his his heel character is basically a hardcore left wing environmentalist. Like he comes up in front. Oh, this is when Bret Hart went heel back in the day, and he went yeah. heel as being a Canadian, pointing out all of the very legitimate problems in the U.S. This is hilarious. It's okay, really so. Maybe there's some crossover there. It's really interesting. So I, I mean, I haven't been watching a ton of wrestling, but I did catch a few weeks ago. He did this live cold open promo on whichever show he's on raw or smackdown i don't know sorry but he he and it was insane he he went he was at like the concession stand in the arena he dressed down all the fans there that they're corporate tools and all this then he walked down in the stands and started dressing him down and he's getting incredible reactions like everyone's saying the new daniel bryan great heel you know he's been a good heel before right but this is maybe his best ever and everyone loves it. And it's such an interesting dynamic to me to think about this, right? So I think Daniel Bryan himself is left wing. Like he didn't go to Saudi Arabia, right? He boycotted that potentially. I'm not sure. So he might be kind of playing a caricature of himself. But but then Vince McMahon is obviously okay with it too, right? Because he will go with any angle that's exploitative to the fans, right? Whether it's left wing or right and so it's funny how these two people who I think are probably different politically, Daniel Bryan and Vince McMahon, or, you know, whoever is, you know, booking there right now. I, I don't know if it's some some McMahon. I'm not sure. But they they are kind of doing it in a symbiotic way is really interesting to me. Hmm. And I mean, we, we've heard that before on, on wrestling where kind of when the best characters come out is when they're kind of allowed to be a. Uh, an in a heightened version of themselves which is kind of interesting well that's what i'm wondering because one thing is dre like he's going out there insulting all these fans in their face with this left-wing rhetoric i'm like daniel bryan you're gonna get stabbed like in this day and age like this is dangerous for you right that takes it back to the old school days of, of like kayfabe wrestling yeah when wrestlers legitimately did like carry guns in their car and stuff because fans would get so angry although by yeah. the way let's I'll get us back to NBA because we just spent like the first half of the show talking about football and Let's wrestling, pointing out that we don't watch football or wrestling. All right. So um, let's just do some last week on last. We do have a few comments. Uh, actually, the first two are just requested fan kind of shout outs and points. Uh, so from bot from Russia, um, who follows me, and I think I'm one of their few followers on Twitter, says, can you give Austin Rivers a shout out in box score geeks? I know he is terrible on wins per 48, but he actually has the best tattoo on the uh, in the major leagues um, in major league in uh, in basketball. And he does actually he has a, a, a huge tattoo of Martin Luther King uh, on his leg. So uh, we'll, we'll give Austin Rivers a shout out for that. And he is playing the best he has in years for Houston. So good on him for that. Uh, another one I want to give to. Um, we have think, a photo of it here, Dre. It's a actually a pretty good looking tattoo. So uh, on last week's show, uh, we basically said fuck the NCAA uh, in relations to uh, Maori Davenport. And what actually. Um, so Cheney John on Twitter corrected me, and I, I was mad at the wrong bullshit athletic institution it was actually the alabama high school athletic yeah she's a high school player that did it so the nc and, and so what he pointed out too is that the ncaa actually took her side in this case so admittedly the ncaa does a lot of sketch things a lot of things that we hate we think it's a bullshit organization but we were wrong at the wrong 
governing body in this case. So we meant to say, fuck the Alabama High School Athletic Association. NCAA this week? Yeah, no complaints. Maybe next week, though, you'll be back on our shit list. So, so there you go. Uh, and then I'll actually take us into our first topic with our last comment. Brian, I don't remember who said it, so let's see if I can look them up in time. Uh, but we were asked uh, or told on last week's show that uh, Kenneth Fareed to the Houston Rockets, so it's Janissary. I, I oh, yeah. Know, right? It will be interesting. So Kenneth Fareed is on the Houston Rockets. Uh, he, he suited up for his first game. Now they're down by 12 going into the second half, again, or 13. Actually, there's still time left, and Here's a a very interesting observation. Uh, James Harden is scary. So there might be a minute left in the quarter, and you might say to yourself, hmm, James Harden seems to be having a quiet first quarter, and then he'll score 12 in a minute. So uh, there there is actually a good amount of time left in this game and uh, in this quarter, 38 seconds, and the Philadelphia 76ers are beating the Houston Rockets by 13. But Kenneth Fareed has indeed suited up. He's played 11 minutes, and he is actually at, holy cow, he's playing pretty well, uh, nine points and two rebounds in 11 minutes of play. So he's playing spectacularly. So we we are excited. So the, the real news is that Kenneth Fareed was, I believe the full court of action was waived by the Brooklyn Nets and then signed for the minimum by the Houston Rockets. So we're going to be talking the Houston Rockets again this show because they keep staying in the news. So we are so excited to have Kenneth Reed and the Houston Rockets. For those that don't know, he's been one of our fan favorites forever. The real issue, unfortunately, with the Houston Rockets, and Brian, you nailed this so much last week and it's coming to fruition. Eric Gordon is back. Eric Gordon has gone two for eight from the field. Um, I'm sorry, Kenneth Reed has seven points. I said nine, it was seven. But Eric Gordon has gone two for eight from the field um, and done, done really nothing else. And then Austin Rivers is starting for this squad. So the real problem with the Houston Rockets is they have some horrible, horrible guards outside of James Harden. And so until Chris Paul is back, this team is going to – and Capella are back, this team is going to struggle, and you called that last week. So last week we bashed them for a lot of stuff. The good news is they got Kenneth Reed, which is a move we praise. But at least in terms of non-star moves, the Houston Rockets have made too many mistakes, including like Austin Rivers. You always make a claim like this, Brian, like – X bad player negates X good player. Well, the problem is 16 minutes of Austin Rivers is more than enough to negate 11 even very productive minutes of Kenneth Fareed. Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate. And it's funny how things have developed since last week. And one thing we said is, yeah, they're going to have to sign some kind of a big player, right? They just can't have no centers on their roster at all, except for Nene, I guess. They still have him. And so they did good, and they got probably the best one available in Fareed. Um one thing I have to say here is I thought some contender should have tried trading for Fareed before he got released. Like I think the Rockets are really on top of things here, and a lot of other teams were not. Um, I know salary cap and luxury tax are issues. I haven't dug into it all the way, but there's, I mean, there's no way he should have just been, you know, a free agent signing. You know, he should have had way more value than that. When we were talking about like the Alabama Athletic Association and, and the NCAA. The NBA actually falls under a similar area and in that, you know, players' rights are not guaranteed. In a normal workplace environment, Kenneth Fareed could go negotiate with the team he wanted to sign with right out of college. And then whichever team wanted him could offer him whatever they were allowed to offer him and he could shop around and go to the team that wanted him most or that he thought was the best fit. And then it gets even more contentious, as you were pointing out, if he's on the squad because, for instance – the reason a buyout might have worked is Fareed might have wanted to go to Houston and Houston might have wanted Fareed, which makes a lot of sense, as you were saying. The problem is he was on a $13 million a year contract. In order to make that work, you have to trade equal salaries. Now, the right maneuver, by the way, should have been to trade Eric Gordon, but whatever. And it could be that the the Rockets and Nets couldn't make it work. And even if they could, this gets into weirder territory, too. Uh Last year when DeMarcus Cousins was traded to the Pelicans, or it was last year, two years ago, one of the two, uh, Vlade Divac actually came out and said he had better offers on the table and just was kind of getting frustrated. So we, we've seen many times when a player might want to go to a team, possibly Kawhi of the Lakers as an example, their front office doesn't really want to work to help them or the other or the other team can't make it work. There are so many weird rules about salary caps and matching salary and et cetera that players really, even, even once they hit free agency or even once they've kind of been put on the trading block, still don't have as much free reign as we would like. 
So when you're saying other teams should have hopped in, it, it could have just been the case that none of them were willing to offer Brooklyn anything that they were willing to take back because that's the problem, right? To let Fareed go, they have to take about $10 million in salary back or have $14 million in free cap space. And there might have just been teams that didn't have it or there might have been teams that Fareed wanted to go to and the Nets were – you know, it's – it would be ridiculous and I would doubt that they would be petty, but let's say Farid was like, I want to go to the Celtics or I'm going to go to 76 or <laughs> the, the Nets might've said, we're not going to help a conference rival. Heck no. Are we going to do that? So that's the real problem with player movement. And what, what you're saying, like another team should have, it's like, there are all of these arbitrary small roadblocks, but unfortunately the reality is, so even giving those teams, all of that caveats, NBA teams just don't value players like Fareed like they should, and, and that's a shame. So we, we are happy that he gets to be on a team that, that we like. Yeah, and here's what I always suspect is going on here. And again, right, this is our perspective. We're the outsiders. You know, we don't have all the inside reporting and all that, so we're just kind of speculating. But, you know, it's here's what it is. So I complain about the Warriors process a lot, right? I'm a spoiled fan, even though we have, you know, the best results ever here in Oakland we nitpick and complain about the process. So what they do with big men is what a lot of other teams do, I think, which is they try to moneyball the big man market and they just don't pay bigs any money at all. And they just say, well, the market is going to be saturated with big men because that's how the league is now, right? Everyone wants smalls and no one wants bigs. So we're just going to pick up any bigs we want for cheap and just not invest up front in it at all. It's hilarious on that market, too, because the way big seem to work in the NBA is a very high-low market. Like you're saying, this this, this, this is what screwed over Nerlens. Or winner-takes-all, maybe. Is oh, winner-takes-all is a perfect way of phrasing it. Because, you know, there is an off-season where DeAndre Jordan gets a lot of money and Steven yeah. Adams gets a lot of money. And for what it's worth, we think they, they deserve it. And yeah. Nerlens Noel says, I'm entering free agency next season. I want some of that money. And he enters the free agency. And all the teams are like, oh, yeah, we spent all of our money on our bigs and, and we're not interested in spending mid-tier on a big. So, so yeah, I think that the problem with the big market in the NBA is a bunch of teams, when they realize they need a big, shell out for one of the top recognized bigs in the NBA at the time. And then when they don't need a big, instead of doing what would be wise, because you, you're talking nitpicking the Warriors, despite the fact they've been good, it's we recognize that greatness in NBA teams and all athletics is fleeting and that you need to be in constant maintenance mode on a team if you want to have sustained greatness like the Patriots. And, you know, that, by the way, is what like Bill Belichick does is Bill Belichick has outside of Tom Brady has very little regard for any player in his squad. He, he you know, I, I Gronkowski has gone if, if he's done right. That's that's not a question. There is the, the, the Patriots have no complaints about just flipping players for other players that they think are better. In the NBA, teams instead of going, we're going to need a big, a good big in three seasons. Let's get one now that's decent and pay him seven million a year. They basically wait until their big falls apart, spend twenty million on a big, sometimes overrated ones that you know just score a lot of points, and then they're in the same boat. Whereas you said you do it the other way, and as long as they do that, that does allow teams like the Golden State Warriors to pick up players like Jordan Bell. And uh, who's the guy? He was really good, and then he got injured. I was really bummed this season. He was playing really hot for him to start the season, but he's out for the, the Warriors. For the Warriors, yeah. Uh, Damian Jones, maybe the center. I think that's right. He was playing. He's really the only player that's been hurt all year since his injury. But well, he's got issues because he doesn't really rebound that well for some footer. But he was very good per minute because of his shot blocking and and shooting. But yeah, I but I agree on um, on what you're saying there about Fareed. Like there, so may, are there bad teams that just think Fareed is bad because he doesn't shoot threes and you have to shoot threes nowadays? Yes, but I think there's probably good teams that are being greedy as well. They're just saying I would never trade for Freed and pay him 13 million a year when I can be greedy and you know try to get him or some other big man for nothing basically and I mean it's good to be greedy sometimes but other times you get punished for it so I think that's what happened here well and then I think the the obnoxious part about Freed a, a few things going against measurement noted doesn't really shoot threes and then is is underside for the power forward we both said we would actually love to play him as a small forward yeah. and just you know I would love for Reed like for Reed on the Warriors next to um, Draymond Green and hell Kevin Dur well Kevin Draymond Green and Kevin Durant as we've discussed are cheat codes but you know next to Draymond Green and Demarcus Cousins or next to Draymond Green and Kevin Durant that's uh, 
that's a very interesting thing. And also, I, I forgot a subject that we're going to talk next, which should be DeMarcus Cousins. I can't believe I left that off the show notes, Brian. Yeah. But yeah, Farid as a small forward would be fantastic in the right scenario. And I see people ding him because of his defense, and I think there are two aspects there. One, I think he is undersized as a power forward, but teams play him as a power forward. And then there there might be a slight mismatch on post-ups. Although his numbers seem to indicate – they like his synergy numbers seem to suggest – or stats on NBA – seem to suggest that he is not great at defense, at least post-up defense, but not horrible. So he's not a good defender, but he's not a bad defender. And then additionally, uh, sorry, my mom just texted me. So mom, you're on the show. Anyway, so so there's that. And then additionally, they basically go, well, he's bad at defense, so he's not a good player. And when teams do that, I find it just so hilarious that I – there are some players that are played because they're locked down defenders, allegedly. Daryl Arthur, who was a player that took minutes from Fareed in Denver and is part of why Fareed had a falling out and, and left the Nuggets. They're like, Daryl Arthur is an amazing defender. And you go, he shoots 51.5% true shooting on the offensive side. I don't give a damn how good of a de- uh, off, uh, defender he is. He is costing all of that and more on offense. So it is amusing to me that teams, like you're saying, they undervalue for reasons like that. And essentially they go... Uh, well, he's not amazing at uh, post-up def- defense, and he can't take an outside three, so we don't need him. Whereas via the Brian Binza productivity, you would just go, holy cow, this guy can rebound. This guy can get into the can, can actually get into the paint and score from up close. Very efficient, too. Yeah, he's an amazing player. I don't see the complaint about defense that others do. And like I said, some of the advanced stats that you can look up seem to support the fact that at the ver- at bare minimum, he can hold his own against uh, power forward. So... We will see and that. also, one last thing on that, Dre. Anyone making that argument about his defense is then saying they don't consider rebounding to be a part of defense, which I don't know. I mean, that's a philosophical argument maybe. But, yeah, he's a ridiculous rebounder, and rebounding always gets overlooked in the mainstream, in my opinion. All right. Uh, by the way, just have to give a shout-out. It wasn't a great game by, by any means, but it was not a great game for the classic reasons. Uh, DeMarcus Cousins made his debut with the Warriors. They kicked ass and took names. DeMarcus Cousins played mostly well, but his box score wasn't as amazing because he did something that we've complained DeMarcus Cousins does, which is he fouled out. He fouled out like 15 minutes of play. Uh, But he actually shot okay and looked good. So I I don't think the Warriors have anything to worry about DeMarcus Cousins, even if he only plays 15 minutes a night. Yeah, you know, it was great seeing Cousins play after all this time. You know, it's been like over a year, I think, practically since he's played. And yeah, he looked great. Um, He... You know, obviously he's not in amazing shape yet. He only played 15 minutes, but he's, yeah, man, he, he's really big. He takes a lot of space. He made, he was three for four and three pointers as well. Speaking of threes, you know, shooting bigs. So I don't know if he'll keep that up, but I mean, the Warriors need that kind of player. And if he can keep the fouls down, which historically he hasn't been able to, <laughs> he'll be a big help for them. No, I think, I mean, it's, oh yeah. And we, we didn't, uh, so last week, another subject, I, I guess I blocked it out of my memory, Brian. We didn't put on the show notes, despite the fact that we talked at last week's show. There was the rumble between the Denver Nuggets and the Golden right. State Warriors. I was looking forward to it. My optimism was high. If they even kept the game close, I was going to say Denver Nuggets are your 2019 NBA champions. And that did not happen, Brian. That did not even come close to happening. The Warriors made the Denver Nuggets look like a D-League team. Now, the good news is since then, the Denver Nuggets have played very well. The Denver Nuggets went up against the Chicago Bulls, and Nikola Jokic put up one of the most efficient triple doubles of the week, and we did to the Chicago Bulls what the Warriors did to the Denver Nuggets. Uh, But I may have to temper my expectations at least until we see how healthy Barton and Harris get. But good on you, Brian. Your Warriors keep the upper hand this year. Yeah, so the Biden and Harris injury comment, I think, you know, that's something more to worry about than the eye test of that one game, um, especially in a playoff series when they're going to have, you know, at least three or four games in Denver at that altitude. So I wouldn't be that worried about the Nuggets right now. They are still one of the best teams and look great to me. My, my stupid superstition and I've, I've talked this about the Los Angeles Lakers, who suffered another annoying blow. They, they lost uh, Lonzo Ball for another four to six weeks. Ooh. And then, of course, Rajon Rondo has been out for a while. And then LeBron James has, of course, been out for a while. Speaking so that, of teams facing the Warriors, the Lakers face them in about an hour from now. So that could be a tough game for them. It, 
it it will be a if, if it's a tough game for the Warriors, my optimist will be back. But that that should you should just wipe the floor uh, with a decimated uh, Los Angeles Lakers. Um, but my superstitious comment is every time the Nuggets have been close to an NBA Finals, that like their best their best bets. Uh, so in and by best bet, I also mean like on court, like regular season production, as well as how well they did in the playoffs. Because for instance, in the '90s, Dikembe Mutombo did take them against the um, Carl Malone led Utah Jazz with John Stockton and lost in seven games. But that team wasn't actually very good. There was just a number eight up seat, upset of the number one seed Seattle Supersonic. Man, that is a tongue twister. I keep doing that to myself tonight. But anyway, that Sonics the- team was loaded, Dre. You probably oh. remember. Uh, that was oh, we might talk that in a second. So, uh, but anyway, I was going to say, the Denver Nuggets in the '80s they got they got beaten in the in the playoffs by the Los Angeles Lakers. We were so close to an NBA Finals with Chauncey Billups, and then of course lost to Los Angeles Lakers. So I just want no part of the Los Angeles Lakers in this year's playoffs. So I haven't I haven't emailed Chris Yeh and told him I said you know I feel bad for your Lakers, but this is the best my Nuggets have been in years. And I want them nowhere near the Los Angeles Lakers in the playoffs. So that, Yeah, especially my guy Zubats is getting a lot of minutes now, Dre. He's looking good. Have we have we mentioned that on the show that uh that Zubats has been your guy? So well, I I don't think we've said it on the show actually. He's officially my guy now since I tried to I guess accidentally I tried to pawn him off on Chris, who pawned him off on you, and now he's become mine. So so a reminder for those that maybe aren't don't listen with a fine tooth comb every week on the show. We had Chris Yeh on uh, preseason to discuss the optimism for the Lakers. By the way, very obvious our optimism was well founded. They injuries have, you know, th- this team was a top 4 seed and then injuries have just taken them apart. So yeah. this team easily would have could have been a top seed heading into the playoffs this year and there's still plenty of time for them to make yeah. the playoffs, but you know, missing Lonzo Rondo and LeBron James who we preseason would have agreed were their three best players mm-hmm. is hurting. But so Chris Ye, pre preseason, we talked the Lakers, and we were trying to talk optimism and pessimism and saying, you know, they might need one more big man. They might need a JaVale McGee. They might need a Tyson Chandler. And he basically said he really liked Zubots, their, their center. And so we were like, cool, we'll, we'll see what happens. Then Zubots, for a variety of reasons, got more minutes and played really well. And you, you, but before that happened, sorry, you on the show said, and you know, maybe Chris Ye's guy Zubots will play well. And Chris Ye hopped in and said, Hey, look, I, I said he was good preseason, but he's not my guy. And Here's he, how I remember it happening, Dre. Slightly different from that. Okay. So we were talking on the show and we were just going over the roster and we were saying, Who is this guy and how do you pronounce his name? And Chris told us how to pronounce his name. And then the comments on the, you know, on the website afterwards, I said, Chris, your guy Zubats played in the game. He's like, just because I know how to pronounce his name, it doesn't make him my guy. <laughs> I think that's how it went down. And, and then a couple weeks later, he just started playing amazingly. Yeah. Chris, you should have taken him as your guy if you had the chance. Brian drafted. Bigs are underrated. So then Brian said, you know, he did, you know, Chris said, he's not my guy. Then you said to me, like, do you want to be your guy? I said, nah, you can have him. And then he started playing really, really well. And we're like, gosh, should have been. So, yeah, Zubats has been playing well. Uh, box score geeks numbers agree with that. He's playing star center levels. Um, we've said this before about the Lakers, kind of surprisingly this season. They're doing what we would call like center by committee. Uh, Zubats, JaVale McGee, and Tyson Chandler, I believe. Let me just uh, check in on Tyson Chandler and JaVale McGee's numbers again, just in case. Yeah, and that shows like the Lakers have all these good underrated bigs. And I don't think they play a ton of small ball. I think they usually have at least one of those guys in there with LeBron hurt anyway. So they can still kind of go 500, you know, with their good players hurt because their bigs are so good. So it's not going to last, but, you know. Well, we've noted for a while, and, and they do actually need to address. I think this is uh, this reminds me of an Emmanuel Moutier. This reminds me of uh, players, uh, we'll talk like Tyson, or not Tyson Chandler, Chant, Corey Brewer, sorry. We'll talk Corey Brewer in a second. But uh, Brandon Ingram is just not good. Yeah. And not good. And he's getting way too many minutes on that squad for how bad he is. Uh, I really think they just, you know, he's still on his rookie contract. I think they can move him for something better. So I really think uh, at this point, if if the Lakers can move Brandon Ingram for something and keep the rest of that core together and it can even just get healthy, they'll, they'll be pretty good. So, I mean, even K- KCP and Josh Hart were playing kind of rough for a, a stretch there, but they both seem to have kind of regressed to at least decent and maybe not as good as they were last season. 
but are playing good. So, I mean, that team, LeBron James, Lonzo Ball, JaVale McGee, Tyson Chandler, Josh Hart, KCP, uh, Zubats, uh, hell, even Lance Stevenson, Rajon Rondo, those players are all playing above average. Essentially, you just need to get rid of Kuzma and Ingram. And I, I think you could flip. I think those two young players you could flip. I think they have off market value because of EA points. You, uh, you could, but I think the Lakers are drinking that Kool Aid and are just going to keep running those guys out there to their detriment, unfortunately. Uh, here's hoping not. Um, just a funny note. I, I don't have too much to say on this. I don't think, and like I said, we, we've spent a lot. I, I can't believe pre-show. I said we'd get out of here in under an hour, Brian. That ain't happening. Uh, Carmelo Anthony was traded to the Chicago Bulls, who are going to waive him. Uh, this is just kind of the same thing that the Rockets have been doing. They're, they're undoing their mistakes, which is annoying, right? So it's a good move, but it's only a good move because they made a bad move that justified it. Uh, basically... The Rockets are saving money, I'm fairly certain, without reading reading this contract. I think they're trading Mello in cash to Chicago because I'm pretty sure Chicago has the cap space to take Mello and absorb him. And then as a result, Houston will save the cap space that they can then use on like Farid. Yeah, I saw so, the number on Twitter. It's like $2.9 million, $2.5 million, something like that, of luxury cap savings. Yeah, so I mean, essentially, and they, they've done this a couple times. You know, they did this with Michael Carter Williams as well. And this is one reason we say that NBA teams, instead of getting worried about overpaying a star when you've got a shot at a title like Chris Paul, you say, there will be a way for me to save money if I need to. So we applaud the Houston Rockets this this week for saving money by trading Carmelo Anthony and by picking up Kenneth Reed. But unfortunately, we go, I don't think this season it, it compensates for picking up Austin Rivers, picking up Carmelo Anthony, picking up Michael Carter Williams uh, is what it is. Yeah, and here's kind of an interesting part about this trade that I noticed today. And this is from Bobby Marks, um, who used to be an NBA executive now with ESPN. He says the big winner of this trade is the Atlanta Hawks. And the reason for that is that if Anthony is waived by the Bulls, Atlanta will receive a set-off of any additional salary that Anthony would sign for. The Hawks owed Anthony $25.5 million as part of his buyout this summer. And so that's the end of his tweet. But I can say that it's being reported also that no one will claim on waivers, right? Unlike I was arguing someone should have claimed Fareed or traded for him. Carmelo Anthony, it's being reported, will not be claimed. Well, what's what's funny about Fareed as an example, and I, I actually do wonder about this kind of strategy in the NBA, which will further go to my complaint about how um, contracts are set up. If you're a competitor of the Houston Rockets, let's say the San Antonio Spurs, and you know their center is injured, and you know they're going after Fareed, wouldn't it behoove you to offer Fareed a little more money to get him off waivers in front of the Rockets? If I and I for, I don't know the waiver rules well enough to know how that would work to to be in front of him, but like, wouldn't it behoove you to do that just to prevent an opponent from picking up a few extra wins? Like, there's all sorts of weirdness in the NBA with contracts and all this stuff, and I think. I don't think teams are as sophisticated as they could be. And, you know, the one person we saw, admittedly, we disagreed with the strategy, but with Sam Hinkie, and I'll use him as our next topic, Sam Hinkie was very savvy in terms of moves about moving second round picks and how to draft and all that. And I still think other NBA teams don't go that way and they might. So it's amusing that at this point, Mello was just a, a trade asset, but I, I, I'm enjoying the ride. <laughs> I can't I can't enjoy it that much, but I'm glad that at least the league has finally caught up with our thinking on his play. I'm pissed off. I mean, it's, it, it reminds me so much of um, Russell Westbrook. And it's like I'm I don't like being right for the wrong reasons. I am I, yeah. budgingly. And it's like, no, you don't get to act like Carmel that that you're on our side now with Carmelo Anthony and that you were always on our side because in his prime everybody loved him the reason you're against carmelo anthony now is just because he's old and i mean mm. i lebron james is a cheat code because it's worth noting that at this point every good player from what was considered at the time one of the most stacked drafts in recent era the 2003 nba draft they're all done except lebron even lebron james is out right now right like that draft completely atrophied and fell apart and, and that's what's supposed to happen right if you play in the nba for 15 seasons you 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 get old, you wear down. So I'm mad that people are bashing Mello now, and I'm like, you're not bashing Mello because you think he's overrated like we do. You're bashing him because he got old and still wants to play basketball. And I can't yeah. fault you know when Vince Carter is going on and saying, hey, I'd love to play for for the Warriors. It's like 
hell yeah, you'd love to play for the Warriors if you got a chance, another shot at a ring. Like, why wouldn't you? Vince Carter's still playing basketball, and he knows the second he steps off the court, he's done. So it's like, I don't want you on my side with Carmelo Anthony because you weren't on my side back in the day. A brief tangent because it's somewhat topical, but like the wall, uh, you know, how there's this big contention in the government right now over the shutdown with Trump demanding a wall and the Democrats taking a a hard stance. No, which I actually do agree with. And it it is very frustrating for a variety of reasons to see the the, the both sides, CNN saying both sides are doing this. And I think the Associated Press said something like it takes two to tango, which is just annoying yeah. because before all of this happened, Donald Trump got in front of a camera that he knew was on and said, I'm going to shut down the government over this and I'll take responsibility for it. And he said that in a camera and everybody reported on it. And I'm less mad at like the people on Facebook that are willing to just retweet Trump memes about whatever. I'm more upset at the news organizations that are like, you recorded that. You were in the room when he said that, and you're not reporting on it. That pisses me off. But but that being said, with the wall, I'm excited that the United States is in a position where we actually do have a political party saying this is ridiculous. But this was not a contentious issue as recently as a decade ago. Post 9-11, the United States was in such a fear over minorities, essentially, of any uh, derivation, which, you know, is fun for me as a minority, that they... You know, they approved a bunch of funding on on border security. And, you know, there is a, a, a bunch of the southern border that is fenced. And, you know, so that that's one of the annoying parts to me is that it's forgetfulness. It's saying, you know, mellow and the wall are very similar where people are trying to come out now and saying this is egregious. We don't agree with it. And I go a decade ago, you did. And I, 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 <laughs> I thought you a decade ago. So I'm going to give you a little credit now. But I, you're not on my side. Like you're, you're we're not on the same team. We're not on team no on Melo is overrated. We're on team a team shouldn't sign Melo right now. Don't act like you weren't against this. And I and at, at least to to at least give the last point on the politics, at least I'm excited that they're in the right direction now. That has real world implications going forward. Whereas someone being on my side about Melo right now has no real world implications because you know they're already on to the next player. They're already on to Donovan Mitchell. They're already on to the next <laughs> score. So. Yeah, well, uh, I'll give a little nuance on Carmelo Anthony, and I've been seeing this kind of comment about both him and Fareed both today, which is not just their age, and Fareed's only 29, by the way. He's still in his prime, technically, so that that doesn't matter too much, but I don't know. Maybe you could think he's old at 29, but I saw this comment that basically both Fareed and Anthony are players whose the game has passed them by. By Steph Curry, their play style, I mean. So by Steph Curry and these and James Harden coming around and just shooting a million billion threes. Well, Anthony did shoot threes in his prime, but mostly did other stuff, right? Posting up and whatnot. Freed never shot threes. You can't be his size and not shoot threes. So a lot of people are saying basically, well, the league has changed and their game is not good anymore however for the wall i think it's a lot more straightforward i'll agree with you there um i think you can just draw a straight line backwards in time from the wall and trump to you know obama backlash you know going straight back to the civil rights era and backlash over that and then going straight back to the you know late 19th century and early 20th century the lost cause of the civil war which is you know all these movies like birth of a nation trying to redefine what the confederacy was about and then just straight back to you know reconstruction and jim crow and then to the civil war like it's just a straight line of racism through history right all these things are related dre and i left out the southern strategy in the 1970s right where the republicans decided we're going to become the racist party and it's a lot of the same people even have been around since back then are still around now so yeah i mean i think it's very straightforward what's happening with the wall yeah and i mean it's and like i said it's it's just sometimes i get frustrated in in sports and in history going this weren't you watch we saw this happen and it's kind of annoying yeah. where you almost the, the those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it you just kind of go well it's see. gaslighting dre there's so much gaslighting going on right now and that's very powerful 
yeah, and it's um, we're, we're going to even leave the the stupid uh, March of Life thing off this week's show. We'll see where that ends up by next. But yeah, just people that just say I didn't say that, I didn't mean that. That's not whatever. And you go, I don't know what to do when you did say that. You did mean that. You literally got in front of a camera and said, "This is exactly what I mean." There, there was a, a really stupid joke in the first Austin Powers that did that. But all right, let, let's. You, you actually did a brilliant segue to our last subject, Brian. That I then Ooh. decided to go on a tangent. I called it Scotty Pippen and the three time machine types. And so this is a, a, a popular subject that comes up on the show, Brian, and we finally have the capper to it. In my opinion. So we, we end up in this discussion essentially that stems from the argument of the variant who would win in a fight, you know, the, the 1996 to 1998 bulls or the back to back NBA finals winning uh, warriors with Kevin Durant, which, which team is better, right? These, these both arguably give, um, arguably give an argument, so I'll get to repeat arguably, to being the greatest team semi-dynasty in NBA history. And there are two varieties of how we viewed this before. I've said one is there's a time travel device, right? We uh, I called it Back to the Future slash Space Jam. So Back to the Future slash, slash Space Jam. I keep giving myself tongue twisters this show, Brian. But the idea being, let's say... Somebody with a time machine goes to 1996, just grabs the Chicago Bulls. Somebody gets a time machine, goes to 2018, grabs the Warriors, takes them and says, you have to play for for the future of the Looney Tunes or whatever, right? Our argument in that, or at least mine is, the Warriors beat the crap out of the Bulls, and it's not even close. And part of the reason is, and this is actually a compliment to the, the Bulls, modern NBA is built on historical NBA. Uh, every modern player has the entire history of the NBA to look back on that also built the type of player they became. And as a result, too, uh, I made a tweet about this because and this whole thing came about from Scottie Pippen doing a segment saying how he would guard James Harden. And the, the way it was phrased is one of the greatest defenders in NBA history breaks down how he would defend one of the greatest offensive players in NBA history. And I said – in 1996, which was when the NBA shortened the three-point line and Scottie Pippen was on the greatest team, arguably at the time, in NBA history, the average NBA team took like, I think, 16 threes a game and connected at 36.7%. And that was with a shortened three-point line. That's the important note. It was three feet shorter than the modern NBA three-point line. James Harden this season is shooting 13 threes a game. And he's connecting at better than that rate with the current free throw with the current three point line. Scotty Pippen, if 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 nineteen ninety six Scotty Pippen enters a game against the Seattle Supersonics in the NBA finals and Gary Payton is replaced by James Harden, Scotty Pippen just gets torched and it's not even close. So that's the space jam uh back to the future variety of time travel for this argument. If if we if we use those rules, I say the Chicago Bulls get utterly trounced by the Warriors. Now, there's another one, and, and, and you're going to have to – we, we were discussing this pre-show, Brian. I told you to surprise me. I call it the clone argument, but I don't have a good clone movie. We said Attack of the Clones, but I don't know if that really counts. But <laughs> just a movie about clones. Like, is, is there a good sci-fi movie involving clones? Uh, if we don't come up with a, a satisfying one audience, let us know in the comments or on Twitter. Uh, so, Brian, you said you, you had thought of one maybe? No, well, I thought of a bad movie that I don't like about cloning that other people like, which is a comedy from the, I think, from the mid to early 90s called Multiplicity with Michael Keaton, where there's like seven oh, yeah. clones of him. I think there's eight oh, total. It's, four, it's three or four. Okay, well, and there's like one's crazy and they all have different personalities. I didn't like that movie at all, <laughs> but either, some so. people do. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, so by the way, I have to get I, – I, I'm I've, Probably not going to do a shout out segment this week, Brian, because I don't have one. But I was going to say uh, Daniel O'Brien over at Cracked back when they were still doing video content made a hilarious video about uh, Annie McDowell, the actress, and just how in the 90s there were a bunch of weird sci fi movies that were just about messing with her. So, like, there was Michael with uh, John Travolta, where an angel comes to mess with her. And then there was a uh, multiplicity that you just mentioned. And there was Groundhog's Day. And so there are all these movies about, like, Annie McDowell getting messed with by supernatural forces. That's and true. Catholics. And it was, it was funny because I was, I, when I watched this video by Daniel O'Brien, I was like, if I hadn't seen all of those movies, I would literally think he was just making this up. Like the plots of these movies, which do seem to just be like, let's F with Annie McDowell. But but so the multiplicity, I didn't like that movie either. Uh, 
I'll use it as a placeholder. I'm hoping there's better. So, so Dre, I did Google it. Do you want me to get some of the results here? What do we got? So, <laughs> I'm bringing the web page up now. First of all, there is an image of the eight Michael Keatons with Andy McDowell. That's kind of funny. Um, so, who, what are some of these other movies? We've got The Island. I don't know about that. Oh, Twins, Dan DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger as clones. That's, that's a pretty good movie. Fifth Element, um, I don't remember cloning in that. I guess the woman oh. is a clone. Uh, maybe. Okay, actually, let's stick with Fifth Element works. Actually, Fifth Element works for this point. Because the other argument we have is, let's say you took Scottie Pippen, the, the mind, body of Scottie Pippen, and got him as like a young child. And we were using kind of time machine, but I think cloning would be more apt, right? Let's say you made a clone of Scottie Pippen and had him grow up at the same time frame of like Steph Curry and put that Scottie Pippen in the modern NBA. So he gets modern nutritioning, modern training, all of this modern stuff. Let's say Blade Runner, Dre. That's actually a good cloning Ooh. movie on this list. Okay, clone. Uh, I'll say Blade Runner or, or Fifth Element. Both work. So – you do that, right? You you clone the 1996 Bulls. You let them grow up to, you know, gestate to be the same age as the 2018 Warriors. You play them against each other with modern rules. How do they do? That's a fascinating question, and I think much, much closer, at least for the starting five. I've kind of argued the benches of historical teams, I think even with cloning, would not hold up to modern benches. So that's a fascinating one. So the, the cloning argument. So we, we've usually done the Back to the Future versus cloning, but we've introduced a third one with Scottie Pippen, which I'm going to call the hot tub time machine time travel method of arguing the, the greatest team. And so if, if you remember the movie Hot Tub Time Machine, what basically happens is all of these people from the future, via entering a magical hot tub, transport their current minds back into the bodies of themselves uh, when they were high school age. And so this oh, idea, yeah. if I transported the mind of, of Scottie Pippen from back in the day to the present or vice versa, the, the, the mind of the Warriors to the past, and had those teams play, who would win? And this is the argument I'm making. I'm saying Scottie Pippen, the, the knowledge he had in 1996, the knowledge he even has now, would not be able to handle um, James Harden. And it was exactly to that Carmelo Anthony point you were making. Time has passed. He played in a different era. All of his skills, all of the stuff he learned, yes, some of it's still relevant, right? The, the things that he did, like stealing, blocking, uh, rebounding are good. But he is just not – he does not know the modern game as well as these other people. And I think pre-show, Brian, we were talking this a little back and forth about how a lot of being good at stuff really amounts to um, – really amounts to boring. Like to be really good at something isn't flashy or exciting. A lot of being ex – being really good at something is very rote. You do, you you know, pro athletes spend all day in the gym working really hard. Or sp you were you were talking to me about Steph Curry, some of the, like his practices for for oh, being yeah. practicing, right. He does probably does the same shot hundreds of times in a day. And something like if you told me, Dre, for a job making what I'd make as a software developer, maybe right, go into that corner and just shoot this ball all day. I might tell you to f off, right? <laughs> like. Yeah, actually, I heard a quote, Dre, by a famous bodybuilder. I don't remember which one, unfortunately, but it was something to the effect of everyone wants to be a bodybuilder, but ain't no one want to lift all that heavy weight. That, oh, that's brilliant. And then I was going to say another – I don't know if I'm getting this quote verbatim, and I, I'll never be able to track it down because it was said by Mike Golick of the Mike and Mike show, and it was said during just the normal – when I used to listen to talk radio on the way to work. Uh, so I'm never going to be able to track that down, right? But he said something. He said like everybody – you know. Let's say let's phrase it better. So many people that retired from the NFL wouldn't have retired if all they had to do was play on Sunday. So let's say, yeah. you know, it's like it's like if, if all I had to do was show up to the game on Sunday and play, I'd still be in the NFL. It's all the stuff I had to do during the week. And then, of course, you can't play on Sunday if you don't do all that hard stuff during the week. So, yeah, um, I, I, and that's the point on like um, Scottie Pippen. Obviously, after he retired, and even in the NBA, he's just not at the same level as the players in the modern one. So even if you transported his mind into a modern-day NBA player, let's say you took Scottie Pippen's mind and put it in the body of, say, Wilson Chandler. I don't think that that's really going to pan out, even though we give him all this love and respect because it's a different game than what he was used to. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Although – so one thing I'll say that's an unfortunate example for you, even though it's true, because Scottie Pippen, I think, is a player whose game would have been pretty good in the modern age. Like he could have played. He was a versatile player who can guard multiple positions. But Look the point is definitely there still. 
see even with a shortened three. I, I think, unfortunately, that would hurt him some. Yeah, no, you're right. Like, he's considered an all-time great right now, <laughs> rightfully so. <laughs> Maybe he'd just be a few all-stars and not an all-time great. Yeah, it's possible. Well, I mean, again, I think we, we make, make this point about the NBA a lot. There, There is such a small supply of tall dexterous people or long in terms of like wingspan dexterous people that if you can find someone that you know six six or bigger that has the ability and coordination to play basketball the hand-eye coordination and all that to play it really well and you train them they're going to be nba caliber so I, I i do agree with that point i think scotty pippen's still an nba caliber player in the modern day i basically the argument i'm making is the teams of the past and the mindsets of the past just don't line up with the future. And I think fortunately it's very make America great. Again, we give a lot of credence to nostalgia and old players don't want their legacy ripped down. Right. We get Shaquille O'Neal's and Tracy McGrady's and Scotty Pippen's going on talk shows and saying my era was better than this modern (laughs) era because they want to stay relevant. And while I do have a lot of respect for what Scotty Pippen did, he is one of the greatest players ever. I just, I, I have to say, unfortunately, no, the modern era is stronger than yours in terms of being competitive at basketball and your team would not compete with modern squads that are great and your my and your years of knowledge that you learned across your career which is amazing is unfortunately now outdated in the modern nba yeah and i wonder what the mentality is there because and here's what i mean by that excuse me so the rules have changed, right? That's a big part of it. You can't hand check anymore. You can do the switching defense now. However, teams still could have started shooting a lot of threes back in the day if their shooters were good enough, even with all that hand checking and whatnot, right? I think they just decided not to. Well, I'm, this is speculation, right? I'm, I'm speculating that they decide not to just because they there's this rule where you can just post up and not get double teamed ever. And so teams like, well, posting up's great. We're just going to post up over and over again, and that's, and so they never even needed to go out and start taking a lot more threes. So well, I, I think, think that's part of it. Shortened three showed that they wanted to, but they couldn't. I think that's the important thing, and I we we've noticed this before, is that up until 1980, which we call the modern NBA, players didn't practice shooting threes, and we just talked about how much hard work it is to become an elite yeah. athlete. So to get good at shooting, to become a Steph Curry. You need to have an entire career, right? And Steph Curry, you know, I, I, I don't want to hear any stupid self-made or or, or underdog story, right? He's, he's a player that was Son drafted, of an NBA player, right? He's a son of an NBA player draft, drafted top 10 in the NBA yep. draft. There is no underdog story there to be had at all. Sorry. But yep. that's the point. You have a kid, and Del Curry wasn't a good NBA player. Sorry, Del but was an amazing three-point shooter. So you have a kid that grows up with a dad that knows how to shoot threes and learns how to shoot threes, like we were saying, the clone argument, from the early age. Whereas Scottie Pippen, I think he was drafted, what, uh, either very late 80s or very early 90s, right? Like 89 or 90, something like that. And it's like the three-point line is 10 years old in the NBA at that point, which means by that point, Scottie Pippen would not have been practicing it as a kid. So I think think the three-point difference is that we hit a tipping point where enough players grew up with it and knew to be doing it. And that even as early as 2000, right? If you think of players entering the league in 2000, that means the three point line wasn't even considered mandatory when they were young. And so it was kind of, I, 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 it would be very interesting to, to plot a timeline and look at players and just plot the ages versus three point efficiency. Cause I think there is a correlation. That is so fascinating. And of course I've thought about all these things before, but never in the way you're putting it right now, which is that Steph. No, this is this is really interesting. So Steph Curry, right? Revolutionary player. I can't remember who wrote this article. I think it was on ESPN, one of the big sites, right? A few months ago, about how he's such a revolutionary player that changed the game. But what did it take for him to be able to do that? He had to be the son of an NBA player, which is incredibly rare but then also be the son of an NBA player who happened to be this weird oddball, Del Curry, who actually took threes when almost no one was taking them. So that's what it took for someone to change the NBA, right? To have that big of a coincidental situation. You want to know something really weird about Del Curry is like his efficiency in 96 when they shortened the three actually went down from the year before. And then his efficiency from three in 1999 when they reshortened it went up. So hmm. may, 
It's like he was actually better without the shortened three. But yeah, and I mean, also that's cool too, is he lived through the shortened three era. So he lived through teams going out of their way to shoot more threes as well. So I think... And think about this, Dre. Steph Curry was watching his dad, Dell, do do that, right? He was a kid there, like a, a ball boy on the sidelines almost, watching all this happen. So not only was did his dad live it, he did as well as a kid. Yes, I think I think that is definitely huge. And by the way, just uh, kind of a random note: Have you seen the uh, Burger King commercial with Del Curry and Steph Curry? <laughs> I don't think so. There is a Burger King commercial where Steph Curry. So this, this 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 there's a funny story around this. So he he's he's going up to Del Curry and says, "Dad, what do I have to do to grow up big like you, and and like play in the NBA?" and and Dell is like, well, you got to be really hungry, son. You really got to want it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And Steph's like, yeah, let's go to Burger King or something like that. And then what I found amusing is Steph Curry's actually smaller than Dell. So I'm like, maybe you shouldn't eat all that Burger King, Steph, and you would have been big and tall like your dad. Oh, but, I'm oh, seeing this right now. It's an actual 1990s Burger King yeah, commercial. It's, it's, oh, that's it's amazing. Yay, yeah, it's awesome. All right, well, that's all of our subjects, and we've gone almost an hour and a half, Brian, so I'm, I'm going to call it. I think I, I sprinkled in all of my shout-outs, so if you have any shout-outs, I'll let you get it, and then I'll call the show. Um, I don't have any shout-outs. Oh, I'll, I'll give one shout-out, actually, to my good friend, Dan Stryker, who, told me, who I saw this weekend and said he's been watching the show, so shout-out to Dan. Dre, he is also from Colorado and is loving the Nuggets season this year, so a fellow enjoy Nuggets it. fan. Enjoy it. It's the best. All right, well, shout out to Dan. Thanks so much for watching the show. Uh, this has been the Box Score Geek Show. If you find us not through the website, you can find us at boxscoregeeks.com. We go live every week, usually somewhere around 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on twitch.tv forward slash nerd numbers. Of course, we have the audio show. You can find on iTunes and Stitcher, the Box Score Geek Show. And then you can catch recaps of the live show on channel Nerd Numbers on YouTube. I've been your host, Dre Alvarez. Nerd Numbers. Keep saying Nerd Numbers so you remember it. Co-host Brian Foster, you can find on Twitter as Brian. Uh, have a good week, and here's hoping the Nuggets get back to number one.